Today we look at uh, identifying seepage in ditches and canals in polders in the Netherlands by distributed temperature sensing. A relatively short paper, and also this paper clip will be relatively short. Uh, there's two things that are important in the title. One is the polders, and we're looking at seepage in polders, low-lying areas. And the second one is distributed temperature sensing, which will need some further explanation. It is well known for some time that you can use uh, temperature as a tracer to determine seepage from groundwater into surface water. Usually the temperature of groundwater is different than that from the surface water, so if you can measure at the bottom or where you expect the seeps to occur the temperature of the water, you can locate where groundwater enters the water body and often also how much. For the past 10 years we've been using a new technology called distributed temperature sensing. It needs a little bit more time to explain, so what is happening is that you put out an optical fiber uh, in the place or in the stream that you want to measure. Then you use a DTS instrument that shoots sm short laser pulses into the fiber optic cable and then it looks at the reflected light that's coming back from within the cable. Of course most of the light will go straight but it's every now and then some of the light will be reflected back. Now the time of flight within the cable determines then the place from where the photons that are reflected or scattered back to the DTS instrument were located. Subsequently there is some subtle changes in the frequencies of some of the photons. So most of the photons come back at the same frequency at which they started out but some of them come back with a higher frequency and some of them came, come back with a lower frequency. The ones that come back with a lower frequency we call stokes and a backscatter and the one with a uh, shorter wavelength or the higher energy we call anti-stokes. And the ratio between the anti-stokes and the stokes determines the temperature of the place where these backscatters takes place. If you have a lot of anti-stokes the temperature is high. Or if you have almost no anti-stokes it's a cold temperature. And amazingly you can use this fiber optic cables up to 10 kilometers with spatial resolutions varying between one meter but even down to 40 centimeters these days and and also continuously you can get relatively good temperature accuracies if you integrate over times of let's say one minute or so so that means that if you have a cable out of in this case 1300 meters and you start measuring you will have 1300 measurements every minute of the temperature and that's very interesting you can start seeing things that we were not able to see before this has been applied in several cases here we're looking at one application specific application and it's measuring the temperature at the bottom of ditches in, in three polders in the Netherlands three low-lying areas and the idea was can we locate the exact location where seepage occurs they were all locations all polders where we knew seepage would be occurring uh, but where was it exactly and how can you locate it? Can you locate that with this distributed temperature sensing or DTS? And we expect again the temperature anomalies in the ditch to occur if you have a lot of groundwater seepage. You can imagine that on a warm day uh, the surface water may warm up uh, whereas the groundwater will have a much more yearly averaged or time averaged temperature. So in, in this case it would be colder. on a cold day you might expect groundwater to be a little bit warmer. Now then the authors continue to describe in some details uh, what cables they use, uh, which instruments they use, uh, which are all very important and interesting but you know this is not what the essential part of the article is about. I mean you sh if you do it yourself you should understand it but otherwise uh, that's not necessary. And the first case they look at is in what is called the Wieringen Meerpolder and they located the cable in a ditch starting at a pumping station in a ditch is called the Lage Quellvaart which is roughly translated into the low seepage canal so they have a, a huge difference with the lake outside and the polder level of more than four meters so they expected especially near the dikes a lot of seep and here you see a little map of where the cable was actually rolled out it was just rolled out of a boat starting at a pumping station here and it just into the canal and here are actually the results maybe the weakest point of this paper is that the figures are in black and white instead of in color and are also not very detailed so we have to do some zooming in on the actual figure and this is a typical figure that you find for DTS studies. What we have here on the x-axis is the distance starting from the pumping station so this is in meters so the total length of this cable is 1300 meters and along the y-axis you have time. 
in this case starting up here going down you see the date and every tag is about a six hour time difference so we have a few days of data color in this case says something about the temperature so white spots are 18 and a half degrees 16 uh, degrees is, is almost black so this, the differences are subtle two and a half degrees uh, over the whole scale but they are enough to find some seepage and you find indeed there exactly where one would expect most seepage zones namely close to the pumping station which is closest to the lake you see these continuous black stripe and uh, these are indeed the places where seepage occurs you also see some other patterns like some warming up of the cable or f of the water uh, over the day uh, set up warm days so slowly the whole ditch warms up and there's a certain pattern spatial pattern in that as well starting uh, upstream slowly moving downstream in terms of warming up then we zoom out again we go to the second polder, which is the Bovenkerk polder, where they also have some very interesting results. Here you see the layout starts here at the pumping station and then the cable moves out here into a side ditch. And uh, immediately we move then to the results and we do some more zooming in here. And what you see is what's very striking is that there's five very persistent zones where you see seepage occurring and here the cold water is sort of forming at the bottom of the ditch and you sort of also see the extent of this cold spot you know widening over time when you go down here and every now and then these disappear and that's when they turn on the pumping station and water really starts moving around and the cold spots caused by the cold seepage into the canals disappears but in general you really see where these uh, places are also later in the month when we have a return period you see this is happening you also see some other disturbances here that are ne not necessarily caused by pumps but also be more local events that cause that why, the, why there's some more mixing going on and uh, these are the most remarkable things a very clear very uh, almost evenly spaced seepage zones then we go to the third and fi final polder. It's uh, Polder Groot Meidrecht. It's a, a polder famous for its uh, seepage, also for its uh, saline seepage or brackish seepage, I should say. It's a very deep polder, five, minus 5.6 on the mean sea level. And here you see the layout again starting at a pumping station. And interesting here is that uh, in addition to all the other things we've seen, you see some cold spots in the canal and we think they come from the side channel. Here we go when we overlay the measurements over the map you see that there's a lot of cold spots I'll zoom in a bit the cold spots that you see here or the cold stripes that you see here almost all correspond one on one with certain ditches so we think that a lot of the texture that you see the patterns that you see are actually not caused by seepage so much in the th main canal but through seepage from certain ditches that's of course also a very interesting conclusion. We then uh, start to discuss the results that we saw and it was interesting. A couple of things were worth dis discussing in some detail. One is the diurnal, diurnal temperature rhythm. You often see that and then it's interesting to see where how these, these patterns emerge what the delays are between upstream and downstream points and also that can be quite a large delay between the warmest part of the day and the actual heating of the cable that's lying at the bottom of the canal. Most important, of course, is this, is that seepage, you know, if you have a strong seepage zone, you just see that very clearly as a band that has persistence over time at one place and uh, that could uh, very well be observed both in the Beering Meerpolder and in Groot and the Meijer. Then the next thing to notice is that sometimes these seepage zones fade. Sometimes that can be ca caused by pumping, but also when there was no pumping, we sometimes we observed these, this fading. Sometimes they also observed fading of the seepage zone when there was no pumping. And that could be caused by, for example, mixing through wind or water, or maybe even rain or a little boat coming. You cannot just automatically assume that every band you see is a seepage zone. It could also be drainage from a ditch or a drainage pipe that enters the canal. So you have to check for these uh, obvious other possible sources of temperature disturbance. Then finally the conclusions. It was very clear that also in polders, so in these low-lying areas, uh, using DTS is a very good technique and especially because it really allows you to very quickly monitor where seepage occurs. 
once you find these uh, seepage spots, you still need to have extra additional observations. You have to do some reasoning. But uh, in general, the, the, the nice thing about these DTS observations is that it works very quickly. And that's also one of the last important uh, remarks here. Installation of 1300 meters of cable in a ditch is actually goes fairly easy.